Good morning, everybody. A very warm wo welcome this morning to our premier collector panel. We're delighted to be hosting Ingvild Goetz and Michael Ringier uh, in a panel this morning that's moderated by Elke Boer, who's the editor-in-chief uh, from Monopole magazine. Please note that this um, talk is, is, is going to be in simultaneous translation. If you wish to listen to it in English, please make sure that you've picked up a headset and that you've dialed into channel one on the headset. Uh, another very small note of housekeeping, please make sure that uh, you wear your mask throughout the talk. Uh, at the end of the conversations, we'll have approximately 10 minutes of questions. Our host today will be com coming around with a microphone and holding it up for you to speak into. Please make sure that you keep your mask on uh, when you ask questions. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much and a warm welcome. I'm delighted to chair this talk today, the Collector's Talk. We're talking about collectors today, about collecting, about living with art. And first of all, I would like to welcome my new guests. Uh, people always say they don't need introduction, but it's still a nice thing to do. So let's start with Ingrid Goetz, one of the most important collectors in Germany. Since 1989, um, she has been hosting a collection at the Sammlung Götz in a building designed by Herzog and de Moren, which is a magnet for art lovers. And her cooperation with Haus der Kunst has contributed to the fact that many of us have had the opportunity to see her art in public. Her collection comprises more than 5,000 works, uh, ranging from Arte Povera to Guta, young British artists, and media art. Her collection of media art is one of the largest in the world, including the complete Cremaster cycle by Ma Matthew Barney, a lot of photographer, work on paper, uh, which also has to do with her uh, beginning. Uh, we'll talk about that later. At the moment, there is a large exhibition at the Pinakothek der Moderne in Munich, the classical dialogue uh, of uh, contemporary art uh, with uh, work by um, Louis Bourgeois, Uma Baba, Sarah Lucas, and Andrea Zittel, Rosemary Trockel, Gerwald Rockenschuh, Marcel Odenbach, Stan Douglas, Thomas Schütte, Cindy Schermert, and many others. So now, I've said quite a lot, but just a brief question to start the conversation. So what, is, was it, what is it like to be back at Art Basel? Oh, it's a great delight, and in particular, that it's not so crowded this year. A lot of people have not made their way here from many different countries. It's almost a little bit the way that it was 15 years ago. It's calmer. Uh, people have time. There are fewer people. It's possible to have in-depth conversations with gallerists. So I'm enjoying it a great deal. And I've also seen some great works of art. Well, that's great news. Now, uh, on to Michael Rennier, who started out as a journalist, uh, which, of course, is very close to my personal heart. He worked for Münchner Abendzeitung and various uh, papers before joining the management of a family-owned company. Art is part of his life, but also part of his corporate philosophy, because art is everywhere in his company. Hundreds of works are always on display. I was personally able to um, enjoy that personally because my company was also part of the because once a year uh, Beatrice Ruf herself came uh, around, uh, changed around works of art and if you were lucky you were even able to make requests. So whenever I went uh, for a coffee I saw a work by Johnny Heuser which uh, is thanks to you. So 150 works from his collections have been shown in live large uh, exhibitions, for example, the Kunstmuseum Luzern a few years ago. Uh, he um, has uh, works by uh, many, such as uh, Doug Aitken, Kai Althoff, John Baldessari, Hannes Garboven, 
uh, fishly vice, so anything that's uh, the who's who almost of contemporary art. Well, what's it like to be back? Well, we are all a little bit damaged by this online world, so it's a, a delight to be able to see pictures again, to be see people. And one of the gallerists told me that he's happy that all of the Asians and the Americans uh, are not here uh, this year because they always started their conversations asking for a discount rather than talking about art. Well, let me start by asking how to start, how you start a collection. Where do you get the inspiration? Mrs. Goetz, you bought your first graphic uh, piece in 1969. What was it, and how, what made you buy it? Well, I was in living in Constance uh, at the time because my husband was a professor at the university, and. There was a well-known um, pub uh, run by Ulrike Oettinger. I'm sure you all know this artist. And she showed art there. And that was the first time I found a uh, portfolio of graphics by Paul Lotto, which I bought. But this really gave me the idea, well, I wanted to be an artist myself, but unfortunately I'm not that gifted. And this gave me the idea of starting up a publishing house for graphics, because at the time that was really the big thing. Um, and. I have to admit, with hindsight, I exclusively chose decorative artists because I thought that was great art, and it also uh, sold uh, like hotcakes, but it wasn't what uh, I thought I wanted to collect, so I then embarked on um, a way where I spoke to people who um, dealt with art that needed to be questioned in the Beckett, who recently passed, uh, the, the Six Friedrich from the Friedrich Gallery, and Harald Seemann later, who helped me a lot when I flew to New York to learn, and he gave me addresses, etc. And whenever I met him, he said, Oh my God, I don't know what to, I don't really like the art. And he said, well, uh, think about it, reflect on it, uh, ask questions about it. And that's how I learned to really look at art and to feel uh, that I was choosing the right thing for myself. And my last mentor has been my museum because it, I wanted to collect in such a way that I would be able to organize exhibitions that would make sense. And this made me uh, very consistent uh, in, my, in the way that I collected instead of buying on impulse. Uh, so if I found something that I liked but that didn't make sense in, uh, because it didn't fit in with the next rest of the collection, I didn't buy it. And that's exactly the way that I am here now as well, looking at the trade fair. Mr. Ringier, how did you start collecting? Well, it started totally differently. Starting in 1980, uh, we collected uh, constructive art, Russian art, and Bauhaus, etc. And in 1994, I decided I wanted to collect contemporary art art to kind of like uh, find a place for it uh, surreptitiously in the company. I um, took a shortcut <laughs> and I asked my wife, well, do you know any curators? I want to uh, do this uh, professionally. And she said, well, Beatrice Roof, for example, um, she once was a president of a museum, Take, uh, choose her, she's great. And then I met with Beatrice and it worked right from the start. So I was able to start Start at a highly professional level. <laughs> and uh, I was given a 20 year course in art. But once again, uh, you said you have to understand the context, you have to know the biography, otherwise it doesn't make sense for you to buy, does it? Well, I'm often asked by people who want to start a collection, and I 
Uh, my advice is don't buy anything for three years, just go to galleries, go to museums, look at the old masters, uh, because if you don't understand them, you won't understand what art uh, means today and whether it's good or whether maybe it's something that somebody did much better 100 years ago. So how many works does your collection comprise, do you know? Well, I've stopped counting. It's a little bit embarrassing. But uh, I also have a lot of drawings. I think uh, that's also some common ground uh, between us, um, more than a thousand uh, drawings. Well, I'm a fan of paper. Maybe it's because of my profession as a journalist. And uh, that's also something that you can afford. The idea of a collection was also to accompany uh, artists uh, for life. Uh, if the Gorski cost 15,000, it was still available for 15,000 uh, next year. So this gave us time to reflect, to uh, understand and uh, get to know an artist. And so, so we decided to buy a few <laughs> works less, <laughs> well, uh, and, uh, but I wasn't able to take that advice, actually, so I bought a lot by a lot of artists. Well, of course, it's not. there's no master plan here. If somebody had told me um, 25 years ago uh, what I was going to end up with, I would have told them that you know, they have to be crazy. So how did that happen? Was it so much just so much fun? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's collecting. I don't know whether you can <laughs> um, explain. It's a little bit like a like a disease. <laughs> I have that uh, in another area uh, in wine. I have more than 10,000 bottles of wine. I can uh, uh, invite as many people as I want, but I will never be able to drink all that wine. But it's just, I don't know, the enjoyment of collecting. Well, my excuse is that I want to show the art in my museum. That's always a very good excuse because I just bought works and I thought, well, I have enough, but I see them in the context of the collection and then I say, well, it has to be part of it. And that's a good reason, at least a good excuse to myself, because I agree it's almost like a disease. Um, and because we, uh, well, you're already in the defensive already by saying, I have such I've seen such beautiful works of art. Of course you've bought some. Yes, of course I've bought some. That's uh, obvious. I can't escape that. Well, we get uh, the gallery senders a lot beforehand, and then I look at the catalogues and I might say, well, there's nothing that I like here, um, and I will uh, not spend a lot of money at the fair. But it's just such a difference whether you're looking at a catalogue or looking at a work of art on your mobile phone or in real life. And I've seen some uh, works here that looked inconsequential when I saw them on my iPad, but in real life, they were amazing. And uh, I bought them because of that. And so a work of art cannot really be properly um, uh, reflected by um, a digital representation. So I have to see it in real life. Well, you can now buy NFTs, and then you don't need them in real life anymore. <laughs> well, they're a little uh, expensive, though. So what are the criteria for deciding to um, and commit to an artist, why you want to buy an artist's work. Well, part of it for me is that I would have loved to have been an artist myself, and I can see a lot of works uh, where I think, oh, I would have liked to have been able to produce that, to create that. Some works of art uh, are really close to me, and there's no, it doesn't matter whether the artist is going to be successful or not. There are a lot of successful custom, uh, artists that I'm not interested in anymore, and there are a lot of unsuccessful artists that I collect and that I will uh, keep buying because they tell me something, that they make me think, they make me reflect, they just uh, are important to me personally. Yeah, I would say 
es ist ein Glücksgefühl und it's ich a, auch, it ähm, makes me it just makes gives me a feeling of joy of happiness and also the idea that i'm being understood it's something that i can speak to that speaks to me uh, maybe something like a mirror um, certainly art is a mirror for a collector who's a serious collector and um, I get a lot of answers from works of art to my questions. Well, I never wanted to be um, a, an artist. I never wanted to be a chef. I prefer to eat well. I don't need a, a vineyard uh, to like wine, but I need an emotional link. Um, I can't really describe it, but there has to be something that uh, speaks to me. Sometimes it takes time. Time, and that's dangerous. If I like something at first glance very well, then I, the alarm bells start ringing. That can be very dangerous. It's important to maybe sleep on it or to discuss it with someone else. And then only then uh, is it uh, time for a decision. I can't uh, have lunch with Mr. Malevich, but uh, all the artists of contemporary art 90% still alive, I practically know them all. And good artists have a great, dis great advantage. They're all intelligent. Uh, they might be quirky, they might be eccentric, uh, but they're all intelligent. If you're not intelligent, you can't produce good art. And so it is always a pleasure to talk to intelligent people. How important is it for you to meet artists? It plays a great role for me. If I doubt, uh, have a, some, some doubt about a work of art, I need to speak to the artist, understand the background, um, especially um, uh, in the case of a young artist. They may have created uh, the uh, uh, work without really thinking about it. That makes me skeptical because it might mean that they're going to uh, produce nothing anymore in a couple of years' time or just uninteresting things. So I have to speak to them. I have to find out how serious they are. They don't have to explain the work to me, don't get me wrong, but I have to understand their attitude. These conversations are very important to me. They play a, a great role. And they sometimes may um, mean that I won't buy a work of art. But sometimes a work of art is difficult. But um, when I speak to an artist, I get the feeling that something more, something uh, interesting will happen in the future. And that may be a start of the collection. <laughs> Have you ever been wrong? Of course I have, often. Particularly when you work, uh, when you buy young art very early on, uh, you may have the case where an artist starts off being really interesting, but for whatever reason, they run out of ideas maybe, or um, shift their interest or their focus, which then disappoints me. In my opinion, an artist should be able to create good art for 15 years, but if they've just done so for a couple of years and the rest uh, is meaningless, then that's disappointing to me. And then I'm always happy to get rid of those uh, works again. Do you have any works that you feel embarrassed about? Well, I started with Beatrice, and so um, that uh, uh, really helped me because she has such an instinct for what's good. If I'd uh, uh, collected on my own, I would probably be able to sell more than half of it. But because I started with Beatrice and worked with her for more than 20 years, it's difficult. As a collector, um, well, sometimes you buy something, you don't even have the money for it, so you have to sell something else. And I find that so difficult because I don't really want to give anything away because I still like everything that I've bought. 
Es, es gibt ja zwei Möglichkeiten. Well, es, there are two die, die eine ist die des Marktes. possibilities. Well, weniger, one is uh, the question of the market. Uh, in, I'm not that Markt interested in it. Uh, sometimes artists disappear es, off the market or their works uh, suddenly Wurst, drop in price. Darum, um, I don't care yeah. about that. Und, For me, und, what's important sagen, is whether I like it. Allen, muss ich sagen, and der, der Er hatte zumindest mal eine tolle Farbe. So I can say about all of the artists that I've bought that they've had a great phase. Maybe they don't do anything else for 20 years, but that doesn't matter because I have the work that they did, they created at the time. And and that's what's important. We don't just exhibit the masterpieces, but also pieces that even good collectors don't know. I love seeing the collections of other collectors. And there are two kinds, the icons, masters, and uh, what's really bad is if they're then a uh, painting made by their wife or something uh, is added to the collection. That's a terrible thing. But um, there are also collectors that I don't know, and they, who have works of art that I don't know, and that's exciting. So do you live with art? Well, of course, you all have your depots, you have your museums, but how do you select what you want to see at home? Do you change your uh, works of art at home? Well, we used to change all the paintings around the company at once, and that uh, means changing 150. But now, we just uh, change uh, floor by floor every couple of months. And this means that people get the impression that there's always something new happening at home. Um, it's always the same process, um, because this could really lead to divorce. It's a very emotional process. We said uh, right from the start that Beatrice would do it. Um, I select uh, 200 uh, things with Beatrice and then I show my wife. And if she, if she gives a thumbs down, we can't do it. You can't have uh, a picture at home that you don't like. She's very tolerant. But maybe out of the 200, we might be left with 160. And then, of course, we have to paint all of the walls, so it's a lot of work. And, um, then Beatrice and Arthur, the other curator, um, put the works in the house. We usually leave while they do that. And then when we get back, they show us. And it's always great. Now, I have learned what hanging up pictures means. I don't have the ideas that they have. They combine things that I would never have combined, and it looks great. We now have done this process uh, five or six or seven times, and every time I say, well, this is better than ever before. And then after two or three years, you think, well, there's uh, something else that I would like to see around, and then after a fourth year, the process starts over again. That's, that's, that sounds great. Well, how do you do it? Well, I like curating. I enjoy it almost as much as uh, collecting, and so I was able to do that in the museums, and now that I've donated the museum to um, Bavaria, um, we have a curator who also uh, organizes uh, wonderful exhibitions at home. I change things around every three months. Often uh, newly bought works that I want to take more time uh, to look at, that I want to live with, that I want to experience. So this gives me the opportunity to having a dialogue with my work. So every three months I change the pictures, I create a bit of a show. I develop a little bit of a concept for that and I enjoy that. I enjoy the process uh, that uh, I 
start every three ja months. Schon sehr, ähm, lange, ähm, well, im, you im have Sammeln, both been ähm, active collectors for a long time. Sich denn der Kunstbetrieb geändert so in how der has Zeit? the art world changed during that time? Sagen. It's ja, changed äh, also a great deal. Nicht wie meine Oma, die sagt, früher war alles besser. I don't want to sound like my grandmother who says everything used to be better, but anyway, in the 70s, in the 1970s, when there was an exhibition, uh, the artists would be present, the lecturers would be present, the galleries would be present, and there was a lot of time to discuss the art. Es war überhaupt nicht die Idee, man konnte sich nicht vorstellen, dass Kunst einmal einen an Mehrzuwachs bekommen würde, dass Kunst eine Kapitalanlage uh, oder gar auch ein Prestigeobjekt, sondern es war einfach eine, äh, eine Leidenschaft, die man mit, mit verschiedenen Leuten geteilt hat. Uh, und, ähm, und daher war das ein würde ich sagen, eine sehr starke intellektuelle Auseinandersetzung. So, it was a strong intellectual und heute ähm, Gibt es das auch uh, noch, aber es gibt uh, elements, which is still happening today, but there are collectors who wird dieses Kunstwerk im Wert steigen, ähm, give uh, the art a more fleeting, some more fleeting attention, also more thinking about whether the value is going to increase. Und, so a lot of it is seen in the different aspects. Gefahr, dass, um, this runs the risk that gallerists and manipulate artists Und, ähm, good artists, bad artists, because diese Auseinandersetzung oder dieses, das Kunstwerk zu hinterfragen nicht mehr stattfindet. Uh, bei they no longer ask the questions. Wo ich dann frage, warum I often das see that. I ask uh, people why they bought, ja, bought a piece of war art, and the uh, answer is just that it's uh, from a particular gallery, and uh, which promises uh, that the art is going to increase in value. That's different. I don't want to just say um, that everything's terrible today, but this is just a different generation that deals with money maybe differently too than I did. Well, it's also changed since the 90s. Jetzt gibt es kurz diese Ansage, da sollen wir kurz pausieren, weil man es eh nicht versteht. Hm. Nee, genau. Gut, ich, als, als wir wussten, dass wir hier dieses Gespräch when we knew that we would have this uh, conversation, uh, we said, yeah, we're the dinosaurs uh, of the German-speaking collectors. Und, um, we meine, have been collecting since 1980. And if you collect constructive work on paper, it's the opposite of glamorous, some square or a line on a piece of paper. That's not something that you can uh, impress anyone with. <laughs> um, for my father once uh, came to visit us and he saw that there was a um, hammer and sickle on a drawing in the entrance and he was a bit irritated by that. Well, in the 90s, absolutely I agree, there was more time, there was less uh, of that hype. And around 2005, things started changing uh, with five-minute reservations and all that uh, nonsense that uh, I never took part in. You probably didn't either. And now we just have to accept that that's the way things are. What's sad today is that... Uh, um, it's difficult for young artists because uh, a new person is hyped every year and that's dangerous because the interest then wanes after a couple of years. And when you look at what's being sold in auctions, well, for example, Amy Sherald, uh, she's a good painter, but uh, if uh, a Chinese person spends four million uh, for her painting at an auction because she once painted Michelle Obama, this has nothing to do with art. It might have something to do with investments, although I'm not so sure about that either, whether this can be sold uh, a price, twice a price later, I wonder. So there are two worlds, almost. 
uh, the small world that we live in, but there are also some younger uh, collectors who are very serious here, and there are some brilliant galleries, not just old ones, but also some younger ones who are very committed, very passionate, and it's so much fun to work with them. I think our advantage is that artists take us seriously. Works of art are often not sold, but they're assigned. Some painters make 10 uh, paintings a year, and there are 100 uh, collectors who want them, and we have the uh, advantage of getting those from uh, the gallerists directly because they don't want these uh, paintings to go into auction. So, much, so sometimes we get assigned those uh, also die Idee, paintings, that's die an advantage. Hatten, but the original idea of uh, accompanying uh, artists uh, over the course of a lifetime is something that we can kiss goodbye. Die halt immer noch nicht wirklich teuer sind. Well, genau. we still have collect, uh, some artists uh, that are still not very expensive, but out of the 4,500 4, works, um, for some of them, that, I think that's just one that I once paid a million for, <laughs> and I couldn't sleep when I made that decision. And today, People spend more than on one uh, painting than uh, I spent on my entire collection. But the other side of that is that you can buy paintings that nobody wants, nobody has ever heard of, and they pay, uh, cost next to nothing, uh, and they're brilliant. Well, also, um, a lot of art that's very easily digestible is sold for very little money. It has something to do with people just wanting something that's aesthetic. Just think about the example of Liebach. At the same time as uh, Schiele, the contemporary of Schiele, and Lehmbach earned a lot of money with his very um, pleasing uh, paintings, whereas Schiele died in poverty because he was unable to sell his paintings. And today, Schiele is worth millions, and Lehmbach is uh, totally uninteresting. And so I think a lot of that is happening at the moment. So this pleasing, pleasing art is popular. Gallerists know that it works. And it's very uh, easy to manipulate the uh, worth, the value of a painting through auctions or in a gallery. And many uh, collectors believe that the value will increase and go with this uh, increase of price in an auction, and I find that difficult and dangerous. It, I feel sorry for those artists who really have something to say. Uh, they are often sell their works cheaply, and nobody gives them any attention. But I wonder whether the, any uh, most of those works that are being sold today at a very high price will uh, play a role in 50 years, I wonder. Of course, there are exceptions to that. Um, there are a lot of artists, I'd say, who um, I don't really understand why they're uh, so expensive. There is a trend towards figurative paintings because it sells easily, easily. And if you then come from Africa and you've been allegedly forgotten, then this can really boost the prices. And whether this will be seen in 20 years' time, I don't know. Uh, there's no doubt that there is forgotten art uh, from Africa, uh, women artists, and, and there are also women who would have been better left forgotten, I'm sorry to have to say that, because their art wasn't that brilliant, that it should now cost half a million. Yeah. So you have to be discerning here. When gender comes before quality, we have a problem. And yeah. 
because quality should be, of course, a priority. But I have to say something now. The idea that you hang out the pictures with Münchner, but army to be as Pilsen next to Picasso, that's a hard act to follow. So when uh, hanging pictures in museums, you have to be careful, you have to uh, think about who you place, what you place what next to what. Um, I think that it's great that's not, you always just follow the um, canon, but uh, at the Museum of Modern Art sometimes too, if an unknown artist is next to Matisse, it's difficult for them. Well, there was um, a, an artist from Haiti who was uh, next to Liechtenstein. But it's also um, a challenge to uh, maybe take the artist off their pedestal and uh, maybe match them with something that may seem a bit profane. As the viewer, you have the opportunity to then to think about it. I think that not everything has to be congruent. I think it's a challenge to combine something very good with something that's maybe less good, to give you the opportunity to judge. Because there are some artists that uh, us on such a high pedestal that nobody would dare question anything. Well, of course, Picasso is undisputed, but still, um, we can still ask whether a particular um, picture is as good as they all say. I've seen some uh, Picassos that weren't that great. They're not being shown that much. There is one museum in Spain. They unfortunately only show uh, the bad Picasso pictures. And I was actually <laughs> shocked. Well, he created 30,000 pictures, and of course, they're not all masterpieces. So I think sometimes you also have to see the reality of a particular artist, and that is why uh, it also might make sense to maybe combine their art with uh, that of someone who's never reached that kind of level. I think it's a challenge for the viewer. Um, there's a bank, by the way, that is now selling shares of a Picasso painting. So you can uh, invest 5,000. Is it a good one or a bad one? Well, I don't want to insult the bank. I wouldn't say that it's one of the masterpieces, but uh, the rest is up to the eyes of the <laughs> so you can buy shares. I think Gallows in Zurich did the same thing in the 80s. Unfortunately, uh, chose the wrong artist and then went bust. But uh, there you were, were able to buy an eighth of an artist. So that's the democratization of art. I don't know whether investors are going to be that happy with the outcome. I think your collection has 30, actually 40% female artists. Did you pay particular attention to buying more art from female artists? Or did you maybe have more encounters with female artists? Or was it just a happenstance? I have to be honest, it was happenstance. When I was once asked uh, what percentage of female artists we were collecting. I had to count. But maybe it's because uh, the position of women is closer to me, although there are male artists who make uh, uh, so-called female art, Mike Kelly or Matthew Barney, for example, because they bring in their pers personal life not in the foreground, but in a very subtle, uh, hidden way. And that's something that's very close to me, to my heart, and that's something that I find in female artists predominantly, but I would never look at a quota or anything like that. <coughs> Uh, I was once asked um, by Guggenheim about how many Jewish artists I have, and I said, I've never thought about it. I don't even know who's Jewish and who isn't. 
So I don't reflect on nationality, gender of the artist or anything like that. I just look at the art and if it speaks to me, um, then um, it speaks to me, but it's not the matter of quota. I just want to buy the kind of art that um, I can relate to. Well, that's different between a private co uh, collector and a public one. As a private collector, you can do whatever you please. Well, I think public institutions are not so good at that. I was in uh, Frankfurt recently, the conte uh, contemporary collection was uh, rearranged, and I think there were just four female artists, and I was surprised. I don't have the same quota, just like in every other aspect, but for 20 years I wasn't interested. Sometimes I didn't even know whether the artist was male or female, because uh, it was, uh, the name didn't tell me. And we also have more than 30% female artists, but that's not something that we ever consciously decided. But if you start work, uh, collecting art in the tens in Russia, uh, well, then you're bound to collect a lot of female artists because uh, there actually 50% of artists in Russia were women. And, and then you don't really think about it any further. I'm not a great fan of female exhibitions either because I think they should be hung next to Men, male artists, and then you can see how great they are. Well, you donated part of your collection to Bavaria. Mr. Rini, have you ever considered what you, to do with your fantastic collection? Do you want it to remain in the possession of the company? Uh, are you, well, I know what I don't want to do. And the last thing that Switzerland needs is another museum. We have museums in Zurich, uh, and then in Winterthur, uh, there is one of the best museums in Europe with an incredible collection in Aarau, the best Swiss collection. St. Gallen has also very interesting museums. So I think Switzerland has enough museums. Bayer, Basel, Bayer, all those uh, museums are incredible, but they all need good art. And so um, we have uh, been thinking about this for a while, but we haven't made a final decision yet. It's a very difficult problem, I'm sure you know that, because it's not a collection that I give to anyone. It would be too much for any museum, because 95% would end up in the archives. And, uh, so I think uh, it's a question of finding the right place for each work. Sometimes it might mean that uh, I want to sell it. It's not my life's work. It's, my, uh, it's fun for me, and I have a responsibility towards the artists. So I have to make sure that their works uh, find a good home. Maybe some my children, of course, uh, will also own some of it, and so we're thinking about how to deal with it, so that um, we just find good homes for the works, but not as a, not the entire collection. That would be too much. And also, um, we want to keep uh, the art within the company too, and if the next generation, once I'm no longer here, wants to do that, then we'll have to have, find a way of keeping the art in the company. If I were to take uh, down all the art overnight, uh, all the art overnight in the company, I would get 200 emails the next day. It's part of um, the fabric of the company. It creates a 
certain mm -hmm. atmosphere. And, uh, but, uh, ihre Sammlung ist Absolutely. Da jetzt, uh, I gesagt, thought it was fantastic too. Gibt, um, so, uh, but your collection is now partly in a museum. Mm -hmm. You've also uh, made some donations. Ja, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but you continue collecting. Auch, uh, Absolutely. The museum is going to survive and they're going to continue uh, creating exhibitions and I'm sure that uh, the, collect the collection will persist. Uh, some of it uh, belongs to my children and my husband too. So it's, uh, it's going to be available to the museum. And I have also thought about um, where the works will end up if I donate them to a museum. I've uh, <laughs> spoke to museums and said, well, donation, well, um, donations are risky because uh, the works will end up in the basement. In the, uh, ex at the exhibition uh, of the Pinacothèque de Modern, we now found that uh, some of the works have never been shown. They may not be famous artists, but they're wonderful, and they've never been shown to the public. It, of course, it always depends on the curator in question, on their taste, on their preferences, and that is why I did a donation to the Bavarian state so that several people would make decisions on what would be shown. So maybe that's the best way of donating, but I wouldn't donate to a museum directly. Vor allen Dingen auch restauratorische ähm, Anforderungen muss man eigentlich, wenn man eine Sammlung hat, da auch Leute beschäftigen, die so genau das auch collection, machen. So, if you have a collection, do you need uh, restaurators uh, also for media art? Yes, I have two people who do that. An, dann hast du wenig um, Raum und, uh, I thought we'll start with a media etwas, collection. Uh, wo du dich nicht drum kümmern that's musst. something. <laughs> and uh, because I thought it wouldn't take up much space, it wouldn't need so much attention. But uh, actually, the formats keep changing. Uh, we have to make new contracts with the artists. Uh, also uh, it's for uh, also transfer migration to new formats. I thought that it was going to be easier, but it's still fun. Ja, ich glaube, wir können jetzt äh, langsam das Gespräch mal I think öffnen, that it's time to open up um, for questions from the audience. Hier ist ein Mikrofon im Raum. We have a microphone in the room. Ja, da vorne ist eine Frage. Sehr gut. There's hier a question here at the front. Doch, das Mikro kommt. Es dau dauert eine Sekunde. Sorry. Ja, okay. Ja, Stefan Hildebrand. Stefan Hildebrand. I have a question to both of you. Man merkt schon, dass es in den letzten Jahren In the last few years we have seen a difference in terms of the dynamics of the art market in America and in Europe. Mr. Marigny, you have a uh, relatively American collection, if I may say so, very much uh, based on the aesthetics and the language of America, which is very fascinating and almost unique in Switzerland. So how do you judge well, what's your take on this uh, observation that the major artists' careers are being forged in America and Europe is always being left behind almost. And someone like Urs Fischer has to go to New York to uh, be uh, successful or Nicolas Timus needs to go to New York. What's your take on that? Well, if you go to the uh, uh, Pompidou Museum and look at the collection there, if you look at the 
era from before uh, until the Second World War. Everything is really uh, outstanding. There's not just one Matisse, but uh, loads of them. But if you now look at the collection after the Second World War, you might find some Eve Klein, and that's it. Everything was moved to New York. And these centers keep shifting. There was an Axis, Moscow, Berlin, and France. And so this is always changing. But and then in the 1980s, there was German North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, George Kunder went to Cologne because things were happening there. But particularly after the war, it's been New York. And today, New York is still also the strongest uh, trade uh, center for art. And of course, artists uh, have an instinct for that. That, uh, Italian artists didn't used to go uh, be close to the Medici because they preferred the pasta there, but because there was money to be made there. And so maybe it will change to Shanghai one day or wherever, but it's not forever. But I also think that the way of collecting differs. Um, Americans uh, don't really understand European art very often. Let's just take boys. Boys is just not uh, well received in America. But even Bruce Norman, a very untypical American artist, was uh, successful in Europe for a long time and only came to success later in America. Ronnie Horn, same thing. She's a European uh, artist today, but Americans find her difficult. Where Kashi Murakami, uh, a very different kind of art, uh, that's a very different type of art in America. That plays a major role in uh, this lack of recognition of European artists in America. I'm always surprised because I think we have such wonderful artists in Europe. Why uh, doesn't it work in America? And this um, is all uh, based on the question whether one of the ten major galleries are prepared to take on uh, those European artists, but they select according to certain criteria because they better understand the American taste. I have many artists uh, in my collection who I think are great, but they're probably never going to play a role in the market. But for me, they're much more important than some of the successful artists in America. Well, sometimes it's the other way around. I have no proof, but I would say that, that there are probably as many Mike Kelly uh, uh, works in uh, European collections than there are in America because his art is very complex and difficult and demanding, something that you have to take your time, not something that you can just nail to the wall and uh, everyone will understand it. Well, art has a lot to do with brands. It's just like uh, your Louis Vuitton bag, and um, maybe Europeans are a little bit, uh, have a bit of a different uh, stance on that. Have another question, perhaps? Please ask your questions. It's a unique opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Ingvild. I was really interested in, in uh, you talking about your collection being a bit like a mirror. Um, are there artists that you have an affinity with that you uh, feel drawn to their work again and again? Lieblingskünstler, Sie fand es toll mit dem, äh, mit dem Spiegel, dass Kunst ein Spiegel ja. ist und ob es ja. Künstlerinnen oder Künstler gibt, die wirklich, äh, zu denen Sie immer wieder zurückkehren. Ja, äh, yes. Also sind, äh, es gibt eben yes. äh, Künstler, also ich habe Künstler und Künstlerinnen, die ich... Äh, There are artists, in, both in male and female, und die ich that kommt, I collect, uh, whose work I collect extensively and I'm always looking at what they're doing and whenever there's a change, I buy one of their works because it, they're me, they speak to me. Uh, Mike Kelly, for example, and I have a very extensive collections of some artists that I'm sometimes surprised myself. But because I see myself 
in them, in, their, in those uh, pieces. Uh, my own also issues, my own topics. Well, I always find it psychologically uh, interesting. I look at um, a collection and I know what the collector's like. Yes, you can't explain it yourself, that's true. When somebody asks me what I collect, I start stuttering because I can't really say why I bought something. Of course, there's some logic. If you have Cindy Sherman, you probably have also Richard Bings, etc. That all makes sense, but um, sometimes you can't really explain why. It doesn't always have to follow some kind of logic either. We have friends of particular museums and then Sometimes people ask uh, what an, uh, pictures about before they've even looked at it properly. <laughs> and they'll say, well, take half an hour and then I'll talk to you about it. But sometimes it's possible not to answer the questions. There are artists who refuse to speak about their art because they want uh, the viewer to come to their own conclusions, to find their own explanations. So knowledge about art is important, but if you put it in the first place, then you miss the most important aspect of art, the most beautiful aspect of art. Artists are often surprised at the interpretations that are given to their paintings because, or their works because uh, they've never uh, actually thought about it themselves. We have uh, two more questions. And then I think we we'll have to close. Yeah. Uh, I'm a video artist and I have the honor of having two <laughs> works of art in your collection. <laughs> Tor Edkins is my name. I wanted to ask, when did you start collecting video art? Around 1990, 1991. And the videos of the 60s, 1960s, Akonchi body works or uh, this Norman, they were very uh, complicated for me. But when videos started speaking to me, opening different perspectives to me, that was the moment when I decided to start collecting, and that was a very exciting time in terms of video artists. At the moment, I'm finding it difficult because a lot was done and there is a, not much uh, to do for new artists, but I'm still collecting and I find it very exciting, and also uh, your work. And I still um, uh, get sent uh, video work, I visit exhibitions, so I still pay attention to this um, area. And at the beginning it was very intensive, and that was starting in the, around 1990. Before that I wasn't that interested in it. And a question here at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a boring banker, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> could you please uh, let me know your perspective regarding borrowing against artworks in order to release the capital already used in your collection uh, to use maybe to purchase new art or for your own businesses? Thank you. As I think, art to hinterlegen well, to is was use uh, als, uh, mal, art Kunst, uh, mit in order to borrow money is very das different ist, than to uh, buy a share. One is speculation, the other one is interest business. I get a call on a monthly calls on a monthly basis on whether I want to borrow against my collection. And that's the last thing that I will mm -hmm. ever do. I believe that the art market is currently being overestimated in terms of liquidity. 
für, für gewisse Momente und diese Momente können relativ There can be moments and they can la those moments can last where the art market is totally jemand, illiquid. Uh, in, um, in 2008, when somebody wollte, had financial difficulties and wanted to sell something, that didn't mean that they would sell it at 10% less, but they couldn't sell it at all. Nobody was interested, not even at half the price. And so to borrow against uh, something that has that potential is very dangerous. To borrow against art, to buy further art, I know it works as long as the mark market is in an upward trend. But I would never do it. Yes, the art market is very volatile, and I agree, sometimes artists will uh, gain in value within a short space of time, and then after that will drop again considerably. I would never borrow against art, I don't believe it. And also, in, to repay the loan, you would have to sell art, and that's not the point. I don't buy something to sell it again at a price. Profit. If you do that, then you buy the wrong things. I am sure that those who, like us, never think about the profit probably buy the better art than those who work it based on whether it's a good investment. I, my wine dealers show me charts that show that Aubryon uh, is undervalued uh, compared with Latour. I mean, what the hell? Well, that was another um, um, reason to collect sustainably with your heart and your mind. I greatly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope you enjoy the fair and enjoy buying, as I suppose you're going to do. <laughs> Genau. <lacht> <lacht>